And I'm really pleased to be doing this presentation with Nicole. I really like, really like working with you, Nicole, here. All right, so we're talking about migration and bird migration, uh, animal migration in general, but, but bird migration specifically is such an amazing spectacle of the natural world. Uh, it means so much to people, even people who aren't birders notice, you know, the cranes flying over to, you know, the fall is here or, you know, the arrival of the, the first robin of spring. So migration really speaks to us and really is part of sort of the pulse of the movements of, of the world, of the natural world. So this map that we're looking at right now is a very cool animated map. This was produced by eBird from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, eBird is going to be prominently discussed frequently in our talk today since they've developed some amazing new products using amazing technology that really help us see and visualize bird migration in a, a totally new revolutionary way. So what this map is showing us is 118 different species. Each of these dots symbolizes the average movements of all the individuals of a specific species. You can see the different strategies happening and the colors are changing through the year. So January is blue and then moving through December. And then also then the date is showing on the screen there. So this is showing how some species move much faster. That's what the long tail, almost like a comet tail is trying to show is the speed of the movement of a species as well. Let's watch it one more time, as well as just the different strategies and, and uh, routes that these different birds are using. Some are just rocketing across the open you know, water of the Gulf. Some are coming up through, through the landmass of Mexico. Some sort of this one in the, the top right is sort of wandering east before heading west and then south. Some are, that one there is just rocketing far out over the Atlantic Ocean before hitting South America. So these amazing uh, products that uh, eBird has been coming out with really help us visualize just the scale and the scope of bird migration. And migration is incredibly dynamic. It's a very complicated, uh, you, know, you have billions of birds moving through just in the western hemisphere every year uh, heading north or you know from the equator heading um, sort of away from the equator to to breed and then coming back again so it's this incredibly dynamic um, system that's full of movement of many individuals so maps like this help us visualize just how much movement is going on so I thought we could focus at first on some of our, our star migrants. This first class in the series is focusing on migration from an Arizona perspective, since you know most of us are in Arizona or have visited Arizona before. And a really iconic migrant bird that many of us see if you're birding in sort of the lowlands of Southeast Arizona is Western Tanager. This is a bird that will just migrate through at all elevations. So people frequently see them in spring and in fall as they pass through the low elevation. So you'll see them hanging out in a mesquite tree as they're doing in this um, photo right here. And um, some of them will stay and nest in Arizona, but at the higher elevations. But many of them go north of Arizona, as you can see here in this map. So this is another map that was produced using eBird data. And it goes throughout the year and shows how the Western tanagers are spaced out where in the winter they're really condensed into Central America and South Mexico and then they spread through the entire west on for their for their uh, nesting season. Another classic migrant that is such an amazing fun bird to see in Arizona is a rufous hummingbird. When you see rufous hummingbirds and they're usually one of the earlier migrants to come through as well as one of the earlier fall migrants, they start doing their fall migration in summer, heading south again. Uh, this is a bird, when you see it, you know migration is on in southern Arizona. So you can see here, this is a traditional map that you would have in a field guide, where the blue is showing where it's a winter, the yellow is going to be only migration. So they don't, Rufus hummingbirds don't nest in Arizona, they are just, they zoom right through the state, and they're headed with their goal of coming all the way up here, as far north as Alaska, you know, Washington State, Oregon, Western Canada, and as far north as Alaska to nest. But this newer technology from eBird has given us some new ways to look at this. Now, this is another traditional map showing, giving a sense of how the, the timing of the migration of rufous hummingbirds. So they're hanging out 
in their wintering grounds all winter. So like August and September through January, just hanging out there all winter. And then February and March, they start to move north. They're moving up through Baja. They're starting to get towards Arizona. And then through March and April, they are zooming up as far north as Northern California. And then in May, May and June, they're on the breeding grounds. And then they wrap up nesting and head all the way back down south. Uh, just to zoom right through July and August, cross the entire 48 states north, north, south, and back to Mexico. Now, the amazing thing about Rufus hummingbirds is they're very, very small and they're going very, very far. So this journey can be up to 4,000 miles each direction. A bird from, from the wintering grounds going as far north as they go up to Alaska can be 4,000 miles in each direction. So 8,000 miles a year, these birds will, will do a journey, uh, an annual loop, and it is actually, it's not the longest migration of any species measured in miles, but if you measure it in body lengths, the body lengths of that particular species, the amount of Rufus hummingbird lengths that they travel is 78 million body lengths. And that, if you use that unit of measurement, it is the longest migration of any species in the world, which is just astonishing that a hummingbird can make such an epic journey just to successfully nest in their breeding range. Now we have a different sort of map. This is a map, this is one of the brand new products that eBird has been coming out with and they have them for lots of different species. And you can go onto eBird and look at these maps. And what this is showing is the relative abundance, oops, let's start again. The relative abundance of Rufus hummingbirds spatially as well as through time. So you can see it's, now it's in the summer, they're up in the breeding grounds. Now it's late summer, they're absolutely surging south towards Mexico and then they're wintering in Mexico. So let's watch Arizona specifically. When they're going north, they do come through Arizona, but not in huge numbers. And then watch this and the, the, they really, really come through Arizona much more in the autumn. And this is something you see a lot with migration where the path that birds travel going north is not the same always that they use coming south again. So many birds do do what Rufus hummingbirds do, at least in the West, where they do this clockwise strategy of sort of going, hugging the Pacific coast going north and then coming more clockwise, coming uh, further east as they swing back down south. So it's pretty great to see, uh, to see these maps in a more dynamic kind of way since it is such a dynamic concept. Another really iconic migrant bird that comes through Arizona are Voxa swifts. So this is one that's actually pretty hard to see. Uh, when they do migrate, they are usually, if it's a good day with nice weather, they fly very, very high. This is sort of a standard strategy for swifts. They fly at very high elevations, um, even over low elevation areas, they'll still be you know, thousands of feet up in the sky as they fly and they're very difficult to spot. But when you get a day during migration, where it's quite cloudy, maybe a little bit of weather, we're happening a little bit of rain maybe, that pushes them much, much lower. So then you can see them as they migrate through. And that makes it really very special. I love that when they come low enough to actually see. So Voxa Swifts are another iconic migrant, star migrant as they come through Arizona. And this traditional map shows that they're wintering in Southern Mexico and Central America and a little bit in uh, South America, and then migrating through the western part of Mexico through a little bit in Arizona, California, and then breeding very similar to the Rufus hummingbirds, you know, Washington State, Oregon, and West Canada. I also have an eBird map for these guys. So before I start it, we can see where they're most abundant in January. So they are really cramming into the Yucatan area, extreme southern Mexico and Central America. And let's start the map. So as the bar moves across to the right, that's the, the weeks going by in the year. And the from uh, yellow to blue, the more blue an area is, the more densely populated it is with this species. You see they're, they're moving around a little bit and then they just absolutely surge north and they migrate very, very rapidly. And then they come, if you notice in the fall, they were hitting Arizona a lot more in the fall, just like the Rufus hummingbirds doing this clockwise pattern. So up they go. They're, they're nesting, densely co coalesce, and then head back south again. You may notice this dark masses sometimes in the maps, 
And all that's saying from the model is that this is an area that has insufficient data. So that's why the colors kind of skip right there. So another really good example of a migrant is one that may not occur to us right off the bat, especially to birders. So things like Rufus Hummingbird that just sort of blast through the state and are obviously coming from somewhere else and headed somewhere else, we think of as migrants right off the bat. But many birds that will spend a lot of time with us are also very impressive migrants. So a really good example is chestnut collared longspurs. This is a, a, a little sort of really cool grassland bird that's closely related to birds like a snow bunting. And it is one of the most threatened birds in North America. It's an IUCN red listed species, which is sort of a global system of ranking, um, not just birds, but all species. And it was recently upgraded in its to vulnerable which is from near threatened to vulnerable. And vulnerable is just one step below endangered on their ranking. So this bird has been elevated in its risk assessment. And it is a bird that's really important to the Important Bird Areas Program here in Arizona. It's a global qualifying species and we have them here in the winter. So we do do surveys every winter. You've, you may have, if you're involved in Tucson Audubon News, you may have uh, seen advertisements for these surveys or even participated in some of these surveys because we do uh, lots of winter focused surveys for them in the Las Cienegas near Senoida important bird area as well as the San Rafael grasslands important bird area and they're really rapidly declining so we've added um, a tank assessment component since water sources are incredibly important for their wintering habitat as well as native grasses since that's one of their most important food sources and those are being crowded out by non-native grasses. So they're really dynamic, very cool birds. If you haven't seen them, if you haven't, if you've been in Southern Arizona in the winter and haven't gone to see them, I highly suggest you do it. They're really neat. They're in Las Cienegas and in San Rafael. And they have declined by more than 87% since 1966 and estimated a 33% decline between 2003 and 2015. This is one of the fastest declining species in North America. In recent years, it's always, it moves around a little bit in the ranking, but it's always been in the top five. And recently, the recent, most recent list I saw was the number three fastest declining bird in North America. And up here on the right, we have a uh, map showing the wintering grounds, which includes Southeast Arizona, and the breeding grounds, which is in the, the tall grass prairie of sort of the Dakotas, Idaho, Montana area. And this is their map. Now, this is very interesting. And this is a brand new released product from eBird. Very, very cool to see. So when you look at that original range map, they make the wintering range look quite large. But let's watch what actual data is telling us um, from a, this huge data set that is eBird. Okay, so they're moving north, breeding in the Great Plains, tall grass prairie area, and then they're rocketing south in a very dense pack. And that's actually very significant. There are several key important bird areas in Colorado that um, are there because they, they really migrate through Colorado quite intensely. There's several grassland important bird areas in Colorado that are significant for migrant chestnut collared longspur because information like this helps us focus on where these species are using the habitat the most so we can try to protect and preserve or enhance that habitat as much as possible. So they migrate in a very intense groups and spread out a little bit more for winter but a lot of their wintering grounds are actually in Sonora, Mexico. And this has been a huge focus recently of these grassland, these cooperative interagency, intercountry grassland uh, working groups to try to figure out how to preserve habitat for this, this critically declining species. So migration maps tell us a lot of information that help with conservation too. So another species that is a, a prominent migrant that we all, if you live in Southern Arizona, you, you hear them every spring if and hopefully see them, but is Lucy's warblers. So this is a bird that is treating Southeast Arizona as their final destination in terms of breeding. So they winter, this is a traditional uh, map from a field guide. They winter in, in West Coast, Mexico. They migrate through Northern Mexico and then do have most of their breeding range in Arizona. It, it goes a little bit into Utah, a little bit into Colorado and New Mexico, but the, the heart of their breeding range is in Southern Arizona, sort of the lowland country of Arizona because they're so closely tied to mesquite trees for both their foraging and their nesting. So here's the Lucy's warbler abundance map from eBird. So they're intensely packed in for, for wintering and then they spread out through sort of everything below the rim, the Mogollon Rim of Arizona, 
we have a pretty quick breeding season and then they head south again. So let's watch that one more time. Intense, intensely packed in for wintering, really spread across any, you know, the Sonoran Desert elevations of Arizona where we have mesquite trees. And this is not a terribly long distance migrant, but still a migrant that is heading up here for the very important, um, you know, life cycle stage of, of breeding. So this is an actual nest that um, I photographed in the 7B parcel on the lower San Pedro River near Mammoth, Arizona, which is open to the public. You can go visit there and walk trails. And we've done a lot of work in here with Lucy's warblers. It's a huge intact mesquite bosque in, um, in Mammoth. And it's great. It's one of the, the few extensive old growth mesquite bosques I've ever seen. And there's a little trail going through there. It's really very cool, but this is a real nest. And you can see the nest is tucked in here around this swirl of bark that's created a cavity in a mesquite tree. And these guys are cavity nesters. They have to, they build a little cup nest, a little grassy cup nest within a cavity. And they're one of only two cavity nesting warblers in North America. And the reason old growth bosque is so important to them is that it takes a large mesquite tree to create these opportunities where they find these little crevices and nooks and crannies and cavities to build their nests. So when we lose old growth mesquite bosque, that really has a direct impact on these birds and makes it hard for them to find places to nest. And they have lost some habitat for sure. So this is one where because we're in their breeding range, we need to look around at our own habitat. So this is a very important photo. So this is the, Santa, this is the photo of the Santa Cruz River from 1942. This photo was taken from Martinez Hill, which is that prominent hill you pass as you're driving north on the I-19, is just as you're coming back into Tucson. And the river, the Santa Cruz River is right there. You go over a bridge and you pass a, a hill that comes very close to the freeway. That's Martinez Hill. So keep pay special attention to this large rock, this big boulder in the foreground. Because this is a photo from 1942 from the USGS. And this is a photo taken from the same location with the same rock in the foreground from 1989. So there's been extensive habitat changes to the Santa Cruz River and everything that looks like bare dirt now used to be mesquite bosque, just, you know, just less than 40 years before. So there's been vast changes and huge amounts of, of habitat has been lost for these birds. So then Tucson Audubon, knowing, understanding this and, and learning more about it and getting, you know, data like we were seeing in those maps, We've launched a conservation project to try to create a nest box that's suitable for this species. We have talked about this a lot, so I'll go over it quickly. But we've tried different designs, different arrangements, did a whole experiment uh, in different riparian areas around southern Arizona to see, oops, wrong way, to see uh, what the birds might like. So we created a bunch of different boxes. We got them out to the public, gave them away for free, and had people put them in their yards as a vast you know, community science experiment to see what sort of box the birds would prefer. We got the community involved. We had a lot of help from local woodworking groups that helped make these boxes as a volunteer effort for us to give them away to the public. And we put them up all over the place. We tried pipes, we tried triangle designs, tried more traditional little tiny bird houses, and this was the winner. They used pretty much all the designs we tried were used by at least, you know, a Lucy's warbler, but this triangle design was absolutely their favorite, which is why you do it as an experiment and actually keep track of which ones get used and which ones don't. And overwhelmingly, they like the triangle. So now we're moving ahead to try to get this triangle design into people's yards uh, or into habitat to make up for the loss, to hopefully make up for the loss of these large um, trees, these large mesquite trees. And it works so well. Here's a photo of some little Lucy's warbler eggs inside of a nest, inside of a triangle box. And some little babies, little baby Lucy's warblers asking to be fed. So we're gonna swerve a little bit and talk about um, this other concept in migration. So Southeast Arizona is an incredibly special place. And I think we, many of us are, are uh, as birders or bird appreciators, are lucky enough to understand this. So there's a lot going on in Southeast Arizona. We have three different deserts that meet and overlap in Southeast Arizona. So we have the Sonora, you know, our classic Sonoran Desert, which brings us all sorts of our iconic species like cactus wrens and gilded flickers and gambles quail. 
And then we also have this Mojave Desert uh, influence coming in from the Northwest and, and meeting in Southeast Arizona, extending its reach into Southeast Arizona slightly. And this brings us birds like Bendire's Thrasher, that's a classic Mojave species. We also have this desert coming in from the east, the Chihuahuan Desert, which is bringing in lots of great species like scale quail and lucifer hummingbirds. So we have many forces meeting and overlapping in southeast Arizona, but some of the most prominent forces are these large continental scale ones. Uh, we have the Rocky Mountain influence coming in from the north, and this is what's bringing us things like Rufus hummingbirds and calliope hummingbirds, or even western tanagers. These are classic Rocky Mountain species. But probably the most significant force that makes Southeast Arizona special and different from anywhere else in the United States is the Sierra Madre Occidental force coming up from the South. And what we mean by that is literally the Sierra Madre Occidental is a chain of mountain ranges. It's a very, very large geographic feature within Mexico. So this is a map of Mexico and we're looking here, it's a little hard to see, but right here is a, a a chain of mountain ranges that's collectively known as the Sierra Madre. And you can almost think of this as Mexico's Rocky Mountains. It's one of the more prominent mountain features of Mexico and it is huge. It creates this sort of spine on western Mexico, this enormous chain of mountain ranges. And here, so here's a red outline of where it is, the Sierra Madre Occidental Archipelago. And the reason people refer to it as an archipelago is that's a geography term for a chain of islands. So this is a metaphor that um, these mountain ranges act as a chain of islands of high elevation habitat surrounded by a sea of desert. And that's what we mean by a sky island. So this is a literally a, a collection of sky islands that has its furthest extent in Southeast Arizona. So the Sierra Madre peters out to the north within Southeast Arizona. And this is one of the most important forces that brings us so many things. Things like javelina and coatis are here because of this, this uh, influence of the Sierra Madre. So species that would be hanging out in sort of Southwest Mexico, where it's far more tropical in its habitat, things like elegant trogans can literally island hop up the Sierra Madre into Southeast Arizona. So this brings us a lot of our amazing Mexican species that we all enjoy seeing. Things like plain cap starthroat or barrel line hummingbird or violet crown hummingbird in Patagonia. They're being pulled up um, literally by these sky islands. So here's a good, here's a more, uh, a more close up image of the sky islands, the Sierra Madre Occidental at the border region. So below this gray line is, the, is Mexico. So, so the sky islands of the Sierra Madre uh, within Mexico. And then some of our the mountain ranges that we're hopefully all familiar with. So the one I have the red circle on is the Santa Rita's, home of the famous Madera Canyon. We have the Chiricahuas to the east, you know, right here at the boundary of the United States, Mexico, and then Arizona and New Mexico. Things like the uh, mountain ranges like the Pinaleños, the Galleros, the Catalinas. This is the furthest extent of the Sierra Madre. And that is why Mount Lemmon is one of the furthest, is the furthest north uh, place you get animals like whiskered screech owl because that is a common species in the entire Sierra Madre but this is the most northern extent of the Sierra Madre. So literally it makes southeast Arizona an ecological extension of Mexico. Now I talk about this a lot and things like you know plain cap starthroat one wouldn't normally think of as a migrant. These are more sort of accidental or vagrant species that sort of wander north during the monsoon season or when conditions are quite good. But this is, has a huge impact and influence on this entire area, and it drives a lot of tourism. The fact that we have elegant trogans, which are a short distance migrant, but the fact we have these amazing birds that you would normally think of as Mexican species here in Southeast Arizona, and the fact that this is the only place in the United States to get some of these animals, makes it a huge economic driver of tourism. So wildlife watching has a total economic impact of $1.4 billion every year in Arizona, and that's huge. And the reason that's such an important thing to know is that makes sense to everybody as to why these, these habitats and these species are very important to protect and preserve because it brings a lot of you know, economic impact to the entire state. But it's also really important for migrants. 
And when I was thinking about why Arizona is, is like what unique perspectives Arizona has in terms of bird migration, one of the first things I thought of was the Sky Islands. And they actually are incredibly important both for those Mexican vagrant species, things like Aztec thrush, but they're really important for migrating birds in general. And a really good example of that is with Western kingbirds. So we don't think of Western kingbirds <laughs> as a sky island species, but there's this really interesting concept that has been proven with scientific research called molt migration. And what this means is literally birds that are migrating in late summer and into the fall, birds in the west that are heading south will literally pause their migration, will stop and have an extended stayover in a specific place while they molt, literally lose feathers and replace them with new feathers. This is incredibly um, like calorie intensive for these birds and they need a lot of resources to go through a full body molt to just shed their feathers and grow new ones. It's very intensive and it also makes them rather vulnerable. So they try to find a good place to do a molt. Some of these birds have this strategy and Western Kingbird is such a classic example. So let's talk about Western Kingbirds here. So this is a really, this is another one of those eBird maps. And if we click on it, you see how they're wintering here in Central America and Mexico. They're surging through the entire West to do their breeding. Looks like they're focusing on some specific areas and then they drain back down. But let's watch that one more time and watch specifically Southeast Arizona as we get into late summer. So they're doing their thing. Oh, why is it pausing? There we go. They're surging through, and we do have them here in the summer, but then watch the Sky Island specifically. They absolutely light it up purple. So I took a screenshot <laughs> to try to make it more clear because it's kind of hard to catch it. But in the week of October 4th is where I took this screenshot from. You can really see here that the most, so purple would be the most densely populated location for this species. You can see here that there, you can almost see the outlines of the specific sky islands. So what they're doing is in, in late summer, so August, September, and into October, if you look around Southeast Arizona, you will see Western kingbirds everywhere, especially if you go into sort of like the foothills of some of these sky islands, places like the, the, um, the research range outside of Madera Canyon really watch for that in the late summer into the fall. And there are so many Western kingbirds all over the place. And what they're doing is they're doing their molt migration here. The Sky Island region of both Southeast Arizona and West Mexico has so much food abundance that has grown up from the, the monsoon rains that happened in late summer. So the July, August monsoon rains create such a food glut in sort of August through October in this region that this is where many, many species, including like painted buntings, lazuli buntings, and western kingbirds do their molt migration. So southeast Arizona is incredibly important for many of these western migrant species, ones that we don't really think of as being sort of Arizona associated. So southeast Arizona and Arizona as a whole has a lot going on in terms of migration. And it's such a huge concept, migration, that it really does take this continental scale <laughs> data and models that are only possible because eBird has so much data. So if you contribute to eBird, thank you so much. You know, eBird recently, within the last year, achieved their one billionth data line of data. So this huge, this staggering mountain of data. And then the fact that Cornell just has invested so much into technology and modeling gives us these amazing maps that help us look at and, and sort of see how birds are migrating which really has really great conservation implications. All right, so we're gonna switch gears here and head over to Nicole. Wow, thanks so much, Jenny. And I don't know if anyone else is feeling like this, but whenever I hear a story of a migratory bird, my mind gets blown over and over again because it is just such a crazy, impressive story to hear um, each bird has such a crazy impressive story to be told and I just love hearing them every time. Okay, so I'm going to move us a little bit towards um, how us people might be impacting this migration. And my point really here, let me make it right at the beginning, is that we really do have a choice if we choose to protect and make these journeys for birds, you know, if not easier, at least possible 
or if we're going to choose to make them more difficult. And we heard Jenny talk a little bit about what some of these challenges that birds might face on their migration. They could be facing habitat loss, right, from various kinds of choices we've made as people. They could be facing challenges from political borders that mean nothing to birds, um, but obviously are quite important to people. Um, and they could be facing such things as collision hazards and hazards that face them when they come down to the ground. Because as Jenny has pointed out in those maps, a migration is really kind of a hop along multiple points, right? And if we're thinking about how we can protect birds while they're migrating, we really need to think about how we can protect birds at each of those stopping points they make, right? They're breeding, they're wintering, and every point along the migration journey that they're making. Um, so I would say our, our biggest and most effective tools we have for protecting birds, um, both at a national and then international scale, are our laws, treaties, and various policies um, that are in place for us to legally protect birds. So Jenny, you can go to the next slide. And I apologize, my slides just have so many more words on them than Jenny's does with all her beautiful bird pictures. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of policies in place to help protect birds. These are kind of what I call our top three. So the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, um, that's a really early act, kind of the precursor to the next two. The Endangered Species Act, which I would say most people have heard of and for some various reason, right? Um, and then we also have the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And the, this treaty act is, I would call an underappreciated law here in Arizona. And of course, for internationally, as it really is a treaty and an agreement between nations and including the United States. And we use this law to implement our side of the treaty, our agreement to protect migratory birds, again, on, along every step that they make. And so why have people mostly heard of the Endangered Species Act and not Migratory Bird Treaty Act? Well, I would say we need to work to change that because for us bird lovers, the Endangered Species Act, of course, protects 101 bird species and over uh, uh, 1,026 bird species for the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So that's a heck of a lot. And um, it's actually much older than the ESA as well. In fact, we celebrated the 100th anniversary in 2017. So let's go to the next slide, Jenny. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Again, a wall of words here, but I really wanted to highlight what the treaty actually covers. And we can see how expansive the, what the intention of the treaty is, right? We wanna prevent people, companies, industries, from harming birds and any part of those birds um, along the entire journey. And of course, also prevent sale and purchase of those birds. Um, so I think we can see here that the, the intention of this treaty between nations is really to protect migratory birds um, along every step of their journey and every part and piece of that journey, right? They, they need safe wintering grounds. They need a safe journey at each stop. And, they need safe places to nest and have their young. Um, so just to point out here, this, the treaty is not only designed to hold accountable people that may break this treaty in some way, um, but also to incentivize preventive actions. Um, they may, that might not have been written in originally, but we've really seen it be effective for companies and industries to take measures into account before they start building something new, a mine or a, a new development to take preventive measures to protect birds, protect birds so that they're not held accountable later. And that's really important. And I, I, I'll do a quick metaphor if we think about preventive medicine, right? Um, if we treat ourselves um, well and we take all preventative uh, steps to stay healthy, it'll save us money and of course our health in the long run if we have to go to the doctor, um, get expensive treatments. So I think of it in, in that same way. If we can encourage the preventative measures to be um, part of just standard building practices and all human actions will both save a heck of a lot of birds um, and a lot of money um, down the road. So just at the bottom here, I wanna, again, um, we, the MBTA protects 535 birds that have been seen in Arizona. 
And that is the vast majority of all the birds that we've seen here in Arizona. So it's covering a lot of birds and is a great tool to help protect them. So let's go to the next, the next slide. So we can get off this wall of words here. All right, a nice picture. Okay, so what I haven't talked about yet are, you know, why should we care about this, right? Why should we care about all these laws that seem really complicated and are mostly happening at our higher levels of decision making? Um, well, because that impacts the birds that we see in our own backyards, right? So I would invite everyone at this point, if you have a bird that you wait for every year, if you have a bird that you love seeing coming back to your own backyards or that you go out hunting for each, uh, each season, I would love you to put that in the chat box. And I would just like to see people's, you know, what birds are important to us. So we'll, we'll, we'll let people do that over the next segment and I would like to come back to that later. Uh, but so I wanna make that connection for us really clear that the laws and regulations we have in place are directly impacting the birds that we see here in Arizona all the time. So it's really important that we um, both act to protect our birds and then also those laws and regulations that protect them. And next week, we're gonna kind of dig into what the vulnerabilities and threats are to these various laws and treaties, but especially the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and why we need to be caring about protecting them right now more than ever before. Um, and that'll be an exciting talk for next, for in two weeks for our next part two. So definitely tune in for that. And let's go to our next slide, Jenny. And I do wanna introduce now, so what is Susan Audubon doing to help connect people to their migratory birds, to those laws and treaties that protect those birds? And we're launching a new initiative, we're calling it Free to Fly, and it's gonna be our virtual flyaway. So what the heck does that mean? <laughs> so we're gonna be asking people like you to think and share stories about what your favorite migratory birds are. And we're gonna help make that link for everyone, decision makers, and just people who, want, who care about birds, about those birds that we see in our own, our own backyards to the laws and treaties that protect them, okay? So it's not quite up yet, but maybe start thinking about those, those favorite migratory birds, start putting together a favorite memory you have of those birds, and we'll be asking you to send in those, uh, and we're gonna put together a virtual flyway showing, hopefully, all the migratory birds we see here in Arizona. So that'll be a really exciting visual, but also a really important tool for people like me who talk to decision makers um, to really show how much people care about these birds and want to see them protected moving forward. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I could keep talking about this for a long time, but I really want to see what people's favorite birds are and also start taking questions. Um, I would love to take as many questions as we can. Um, and of course, tune in for our next one in, in two weeks to kind of wrap up what Jenny and I were talking about here. Hey, yeah, thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Jenny. So yeah, we do have a few questions from the from the group chat that I'll ask you. Uh, Nicole, we'll, we'll start with you. So um, we're wondering, are, are we seeing erosion of the Endangered Species Act and the Migratory Bird Treaty Act here in Arizona? Like, um, specifically, the question was wondering if extraction industries were um, causing any erosion of those treaties? Yeah, so we're gonna focus a lot on that in the next part two, I'll say. Ah. But um, I'll give a quick teaser to that in that you think anything that's happening at the national level to these laws is particularly impacting Arizona. And I think Jenny showed that really well with how important this area is to migration and how small it is, right? So these areas that are particularly important and frequently um, much smaller, right, are more vulnerable to changes. Um, the, the birds and wildlife have fewer places to go if something happens. Um, and so it's really important that we protect these kind of critical areas. So, but come back 
for part two, <laughs> we'll talk about what erosion might mean <laughs> to our national laws. Yeah, yeah, good teaser there. Hey, Jenny, um, the, the Rufus Hummingbird map was really cool, especially like seeing how it works. I guess I was in the clockwise, clockwise direction yeah. like that. That was really neat. And so uh, the question is like, why do they take that different route? Is it food resources? Is it wind currents? Anything? So it depends on what kind of bird you're talking about. So for, for raptors, birds that migrate during the day, hawks are known to migrate in coastal areas, sort of hugging the coast. And that has to do with wind updraft, so the physics of the wind coming off the ocean. But for the hummingbirds, for the rufous hummingbirds, a lot of the reason they do a clockwise migration has to do with food resources. So they're so dependent on flowers and insects that in the spring, those more western, those more coastal areas have a lot more flower abundance. But when they're coming through in the late summer, early fall, they're taking advantage of these higher elevation, these sky island areas that are full of flowers now because of the monsoon rains. So in southern Arizona, we talk about the second spring of the monsoon and all the abundance that we get in the summer. And that's why they're swinging east to take advantage of that food resource. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And that's why... August is my favorite month for birding yeah. here. It's a great time. Yeah. August is awesome. For sure. Um, so uh, along with that, when we have a weak monsoon season, um, how does that affect things? And, and then also specifically like when Western kingbirds and other birds that are going through molt migration that come here, we have a weak monsoon season. Um, is there any research or anything done as far as like how that affects the birds? I haven't seen specific research on how different um, monsoon rain levels within southern Arizona would affect my molt migration, but it does make, it does to me stand to reason that if we're having a lighter monsoon season in Arizona, and it's so tempting for us as humans to think of the monsoon season as only happening in Arizona, but the Sierra Madre Occidental of West Mexico may be having a very good monsoon season while the mountain ranges in Southern Arizona may be having a poor season. So what may, what probably happens, if I had to guess, what probably happens is those Western Kingbirds may not be as abundant in Arizona for, for late summer and fall, but they're just a little further South in Mexico. Yep. That's a good point. We don't own all the monsoon. <laughs> yeah, and it's much more reliable in, in um, West Mexico than it is up here because they're just closer to that, that, that tropical system that creates the monsoons. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked briefly about the uh, mammoth spot, the 7B Bosque, uh, Mesquite Boss there. And the question was, where is that? So what you're going to do, it's a great area and it is open to the public and it's only been open to the public for the last couple of years, but it's a great spot. You are going to drive north on, or if you're in Tucson, you're going to drive north on Oracle Road. It becomes Highway 77. And just as you're coming into the town of Mammoth, which is north of the, um, the San, San Manuel turnoff, but south of Globe, you're gonna turn off on Main Street, then make a right on Bluebird Avenue. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty aptly named. And that takes you um, right to the 7B birding trail. Um, this is also a site that is in Google Maps. So I think they call it the 7B nature trail maybe but it is a location in google maps and it takes you right to the little parking area and there's a little gate and you can take a very nice trail through a very lush mesquite bosque wow yeah that totally memorized i'm very impressed we spent a lot of time up there doing bird surveys I, I know it back. i know it good job um oh uh so yeah so debbie asked about the turn before we get to the arctic turn well actually let's do that so Debbie has a really interesting comment, and I think you mentioned you might talk about this next then on the next one, but the Arctic Turn, I was seeing here earlier this week, how rare it is here in Tucson. Like, what about the migration for that Arctic Turn? Do you just want to hold that for next week? Or? Well, I could give a teaser. How about a teaser? So a teaser is good. I, I, I mentioned how Rufus Hummingbird has the longest migration of any species when you measure it in body lengths. But if you use a more reasonable measurement, which is miles, 
Arctic tern is right at the top. It has one of the longest migrations of any species of bird in the entire world. This is a truly a pole to pole migrant. They go from the southern pole <laughs> all the way up to above the Arctic Circle on the northern part of the planet to, to nest and then go all the way back. They spend the vast majority of the year traveling, doing these journeys. So they are going very, very far. So a swing east. Now they often will migrate along the, the west coast of um, like California going up north, but a swinging in east of you know several thousand miles isn't really that big of a deal to a bird that circumnavigates the globe. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's crazy to think about. Um, before I get to I know Nancy has a question that I'll get to here real quick, but um, any other questions specifically for Nicole or Jenny about migration? Uh, let's see. Debbie asked if we could see the Arctic Turn migration in eBird like those other maps. So I, I did put, if you go up in the group chat, I did put a, a link in there to a whole list of different bird species that uh, eBird provides those really cool uh, maps that are flowing throughout the calendar so you can kind of see how they move. So I did put a link in that chat box. I'll also send it later today in, um, in our follow-up email. So, um, so I don't know if Arctic Turn is one of those that's captured there or not, but it would be a cool one if it was. Any other questions for Jenny or Nicole? And people can can raise their hand, right? If they don't want to. Yeah. Time for yeah. Them. If you have like a, if you can see the the hand raise on the participant little uh, icon, you can raise that up, and I'll unmute you, or. I'll scroll through all the pictures now to see if anyone's physically raising their hand. I want to thank Quincy for posting these two links in the chat um, about some of these local monitoring efforts that are really, really important to understanding um, how things are changing <laughs> here in our area. So thanks, Quincy. Yeah, thanks, Quincy. So Nancy also had a question about uh, she tried to sign up for the next session, which is in two weeks, part two. So if you haven't already signed up for it, so here's the issue is that we can only handle 100 people on our Zoom account. And I know it shows we only had up to 73 today, but we had uh, 104 signed up. I never know who's gonna show up unless people tell me they aren't able to make it. Um, so we have to cap it at 100 even though we didn't have 100 people on today. So the part two is already filled. The good thing is that uh, I am recording it and I remembered to press record today. And um, you can sign up and be on the wait list. And that'll um, remind me to also uh, send you the recording afterwards. So I'll just keep you on, on that recap recording email. Um, and we're also working on putting these up on our, on our YouTube account. So um, I'll, when, when that is done, we can send that out to y'all too. Um, so great, uh, uh, everyone give like a little hand clap or thumbs up reaction to uh, Nicole and Jenny for leading us through that. And um, yeah, any, any last things, Jenny, Nicole? Yeah, I have a you? final thought I'd like to share, which is that um, doing the bird surveys, my job at Tucson Audubon, running around with amazing volunteers and, and staff members chasing birds and counting them and documenting them and then all the fun that goes into all the birders out there putting in their data their sightings just their their bird sightings into eBird is what generates all these amazing products and maps however so much of the real conservation is done by people like Nicole who then take all this information and use it to actually go and impact change at the highest levels of our governments and stuff. Cause it's really, it's amazing work to go out there and put up a Lucy's warbler nest box and, and see that it's, it's helping that specific pair of warblers raise some babies, but it takes work like what Nicole does to try to save an entire watershed or an entire river or entire, you know, to change policy on public lands. So I just want to make sure that, I let everyone know how much, how important what Nicole does 
And even though it's not quite as fun and sexy as what, what I do and what we get to do as birders, it's vastly more important in the long run. Uh, that's really sweet of you, Jenny. I'm going to spin that right back around and say that I, I can only do what I do because of what literally everyone else is doing. And we've learned through a lot of research that the number one thing we can do to help solve something like climate change, which can seem so crazy huge and out of our hands, is actually talk about it and talk about it to our neighbors, to our family, to our kids, to our parents. Um, that's actually the number one thing you can do to impact change. Because if I go to Washington DC and try to talk to our delegation and they're like, no one cares about this. We haven't heard from any of our members. We haven't seen anything, you know, no one's written to us. Um, do you have any proof that anyone cares about this? They won't do anything. Um, so, yeah, I can only do what I do if everyone else is also doing something. <laughs> so it, it really takes all of us and each part is super important. So thank you all for being here today because this counts. We're talking about it. <laughs> so continue that on and talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends and family. Right on. Yeah, that's a great point. We're in this together. Uh, that's why, you know, I advocate for being part of Tucson Audubon and our great community and uh, so many people who uh, not just loving birds but loving nature and doing something about it. So thanks again. Um, I will um, send out an email with the recording later today. I'm going to unmute everyone so if you want to stick around and have any questions, lingering questions, I'll, I'll be around for a little bit too. Um, thanks so much. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Great Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have a question for Luke. Oh, I'm finally seeing everyone flash up. Yeah, it's fun. Mary David, hi. 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 Oh, Thank you. Hey, how's you know going? all about Glad the Lucy's Warblers. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> See y'all. Thanks again. Yeah. Oh, thank you for coming. Yeah, zillion. It is. I just like kind of just watching everyone. Yeah, yeah. I'm watching everyone <laughs> slide through. That's funny. I miss that. Luke, I have a question for you. Wait, yeah, don't. Yeah, my question. We are noticing. I suddenly realized we used to have a lot more cactus wrens up in the foothills, and I'm concerned. I don't know what's going on, and I'm wondering if there's anything that I can be doing to entice them into our our neighborhood into our area. We've got an open desert area with lots of uh, choyas and mesquite and Palo Verde behind our house. It's just open wild. And hmm. I don't, we've seen just very few and I, I don't know, if, hmm. is there something I should be feeding them or I'm providing water? Um, and it sounds like you have the right habitat. It sounds like if you're providing water, that's, a very important resource for them. Um, you have any thoughts, Jenny? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Cactus runs are, are one of the more interesting birds. So another project I, I work on is I coordinate the Tucson Bird Count, which is a big urban bird count in Tucson. And cactus wren is one of those birds that just pops up as one that is very sensitive to, to human um, urbanization. It's like they do okay in an area while things are becoming kind of suburban. And then there is this tipping point where when things get a little too urban, they will leave an area actually and, and go into an area that's a little more wild. But it sounds like you have good open natural habitat around you. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not really sure. There's, they, they sometimes will come into feeders. They like things like the sort of that uh, heat stable suet and uh, they'll, they'll come into feeders a little bit. But the most important thing is to to make sure that that open space, that native habitat has a lot of native vegetation. So they do need some sort of the, the native bushes and choya to nest in, but they do a lot of their foraging under 
uh, vegetation. So under bushes, they dig through the leaf litter. So if your natural area maybe is being cleaned up too much or raked too much, that can have a negative impact on them. But they're mostly digging in the ground for, for bugs to eat. So that's, that's a tough one. Cactus runs, there's something subtle going on with them that we're trying to discover more about using Tucson bird count data. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I've got some bug, um, <laughs> bug suet. And the, it's so interesting. I think we, I'm beginning to think I've got a lot of seed eating, bug eating birds around. They will go, if, if they'll wait their turn, they'll sit on the peanut feeder and not eat the peanuts. But as soon as it's clear to get onto that bug suet block, they are there. Interesting. I didn't see Lucy's warblers go for bug suet. Yeah. yeah, I think we've got some, although are, are we put our, our uh, Lucy warbler birdhouse up too late. In the year. Oh, I'm sure they saw it and they might use it next spring. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It took me three years to finally get a Lucy's Warbler nest in my box, but it happened this year. And I actually not in the box, but in one of the, the two. Yeah, the triangle one. We have the triangle. Oh, they, for Luke's yard, they used your pipe, right? The, the big PVC pipe? Yeah, they used the PVC pipe. Ah. Yes, because I have one of those that has all the different ones on it. And uh, they use the PVC pipe instead of the uh, triangle. That's so interesting. Yeah. Oh, one other question, sort of not related to this, but we're looking to buy some more birdhouses and I went online to the nature shop. Are you gonna be getting in the other birdhouses that, that have been talked about? Like for the school uh, cows and the smaller birds? Yes, I know Olia, Olia Phillips, who works at Tucson Audubon, who heads up our nest box program, has been working to get more owl boxes and kestrel boxes and flycatcher boxes available for sale using oh, some of our woodworking partners. Super. Very good. Very good. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was a really good presentation. Oh, thank you all so much for coming. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks and have a great Memorial Day weekend. You too. All right. We'll see you all later. Okay. See you next, next talk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.